हरे कृष्ण I would like to very graciously welcome all of you for coming to participate in this event this evening. The topic that they have chosen for me to speak is conquering the greatest enemy. Yes? When we speak about enemy, this indicates conflict opposition or even warfare the greatest danger is not to know who or what your enemy is Espionage is a very important aspect of every government. To somehow or other put your spies in the enemy's camp. The best spy is one who the enemy thinks You are a well-wisher, a supporter, and a friend. There was a book recently written by the uncle of one of my father's friends. He was, my father never met him, for obvious reasons, which you will find out. This person was a very high-ranking official in the communist government. He was an American citizen. And his purpose was to try to somehow or other infiltrate America with communism and give the communist government all sorts of information. And they give him all kinds of money and other things to somehow or other spread communism in America. Ah, they trusted him so much. He did so much good work for them. But after many years, he saw so much hypocrisy, so much suffering. He realized that he had dedicated his life to an ideal that was completely theoretical and had no practical substance. So he decided that he wanted to overthrow the communist government. So he went to American officials. According to this book, only the President of the United States and just a few of the very, very high-ranking agents of the intelligence knew what his mission was. He would sit 
with the heads of state, with the premier chief ministers who were plotting against the American government. And he was giving them the wrong information. And they completely trusted him. And he was giving the American government the right information. So they thought the man was their friend. They thought their man was the well-wisher. They thought he was on his side, their side. But actually he was on the enemy's side. And he said, so much damage to all their efforts. Arrivo. It's a book. You can buy it. It's all public information. Since the man died, it became public information. When you trust somebody as your friend, but you don't know that he's not your well-wisher, he's your enemy, that person could do such intense internal damage to your life. What is the greatest enemy? Who is the greatest enemy? According to the scriptures and according to basic common sense. The ultimate, original enemy is ignorance. Avidya. What is the definition of ignorance? Maya. Maya means illusion. Maya means the energy that keeps us in ignorance. Maya means that which is not. When we forget who we are, what is our needs, what is our real desires, that is ignorance. So who are we? This is the first question dealt with in Srimad Bhagavad Gita. According to this position, practically the entire human population of the world is in ignorance. Surrendered to their greatest enemy. Originally, we are all perfect parts of God. We are not the material body and we are not the material mind. The body is changing. How much the mind is changing through boyhood to youth to old age. And ultimately the inevitable must come upon everyone. Death. What is death? The body is there, the brain is there, the blood is there, the hearts are there, the the organs are there, everyone's there except the person. The conscious force, the animator, the driver of the vehicle of this body has departed. Who is that? We are not simply the physical components of the body, we are the consciousness within the body. When the consciousness leaves, the body is dead. The nature of that consciousness, that is the highest science. That is the most important of all forms of knowledge. Mamai vamsa jiva loke jiva buddha sanatana. We are all part of the supreme consciousness, the absolute truth. 
The Jivatma is Satchit Ananda. Eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. That is you. That is your nature. However, when we forget who we are, what our real needs are and what our real wants are, that is the basis, the origin of ignorance. And all the problems, all the sufferings in the entire creation stem from that forgetfulness. We are sat. That means we're eternal. That means the soul, for the soul, death, old age, is completely artificial, unnatural. Cannot be accommodated. But when the soul is identifying with this temporary body, so many anxieties. Jiva Jiva Sajivanam. So much struggle for survival. So much fear of death. So much fear within this world. Fear is the greatest stimulator there is. People get jobs and work foaming at the mouth due to fear. Fear of not having food. Fear of not having a proper place to stay. Fear of no security for yourself, for your family. Fear of social disgrace. And the greatest expenditures by practically every country in the world today is on defense. Building militaries, building weaponry, arsenals, bombs. It's motivated by fear. Defense is born of fear. Because we're eternal. Therefore, something so artificial as death is very fearful. Our relationships are eternal. But we're under the conception that our relationships end with the end of the body. Then we fear for others. Sat Chit Ananda. Chit means full of knowledge. If we think we're this, we're something we're not, if the eternal thinks that it's temporary, that ignorance, that achit, is a cause of so much anxiety and disturbance. But the most essential aspect of the true soul is ananda. It is by its nature full of bliss. It is ecstatic. And where does that ecstasy originate? In love. Love is the greatest need, the greatest want in all life. If you have it, you're happy in any situation. And if you don't have it, you'll be miserable, lonely, and frustrated in any situation. The soul's nature is to know the absolute, pure, attractive, supreme person. But when we forget our relationship with the supreme, when we forget the eternal love of the soul for God, We cannot live without love. We must search somewhere for that experience. So we try to find that 
through the temporary objects of this world. In Sanskrit, that is called kama or lust. What really does kama or lust mean? In essence, it means to try to enjoy in a state of ignorance. To try to find pleasure. Ananda Mayobhyasa, we're pleasure seeking loving entities. When we try to find pleasure in the temporary objects that really have nothing to do with our true self, that is lust. Gold and iron are both metal, but they're very different. Love and lust. The difference is, when our propensity for pleasure is directed toward the needs of the soul, toward service to God, then we experience infinite pleasure in that love. But when that same propensity, that same need is misdirected on the basis of the illusion, I am this body, I am this mind, toward the temporary objects of the senses, it becomes lust. Krishna tells in third chapter of Gita, Kama Esha Krode Esha Rajoguna Shamud Baba Mahashano Mahapadma Vidya Namiyabhairana. It is lust only Arjuna, Kama, which is later transformed into wrath, which is the all devouring sinful enemy of this world. In economics, Simple problem. Everyone has unlimited desires. And there's only so many resources within the world to fulfill people's desires. So people are fighting over property. People are fighting over wealth. People are fighting over land, over food. People are fighting over... the limited resources of our planet. Even in a little house, children are fighting over whose toy, over whose bedroom. And then they grow a little older, they become more intelligent, they have higher educations. They start fighting over money and prestige. People kill each other fighting over their, a woman. Governments build massive armies fighting over land. So much fighting. So much competition in the business world. So much competition amongst politicians. So many people want the same post. Great conflict. Why? We are looking for a spiritual experience which is eternal and full of unending pleasure. We are looking for love. In the material plane through a material vehicle. So Krishna explains in Gita, this is the greatest enemy. Lust doesn't simply mean the passion between man and woman. Lust means the desire to enjoy. On the gross plane, it is enjoying through the five senses. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the flesh. And on the subtle level, lust means the desire for profit, adoration, and distinction. It's 
It's very dangerous. Krishna explains in Gita that there are three places that this enemy of lust is stationed. Within the senses, within the mind, and within the intelligence. Now if we identify it as an enemy, we must learn where that enemy is and how to conquer it. Krishna says in Gita, Banduratmatmanasthasya yenatmai vapanachata anatmanasthasatrute varthetaimai vasatrabhat. That one who controls the mind, the mind is the best friend, but one who, for one who fails to control the mind, the mind is the very worst enemy. How to control the mind. That is the subject of this beautiful song we sang tonight by Govinda Das. He's praying to his mind. Please engage yourself in the loving service of Srinanda Nandana, Sri Krishna. Then you will be fearless. This human life is so very, very rare. Why should we waste it seeking the same things that are available to the lower species, the fish, the insects, the birds, the reptiles, and the animals? Some physical experiences of pleasure and some mental satisfaction. All of those things Goals that people are trying to achieve, Govinda Das says, they are all just like a drop of water on a lotus leaf. They are here today and tomorrow they are gone. Therefore, my dear mind, please engage in your natural propensity to worship the Supreme Lord. The nature of the soul, the consciousness, is it's looking for unending, unlimited pleasure. But when it looks for it in the dying, temporary objects of the world, it is disappointed. When you find some semblance of that pleasure of love, even a drop of, of a hint of that pleasure, you become practically uncontrollably attached to that object. But then when it Fall, drops away like the water on the lotus leaf. Such great suffering. Such great anxieties. And how do people deal with these anxieties in this world? The extreme frustration comes out in suicide, Madness, atrocities, cruelties, of these people who are serial murderers. It's not that they're from really, really poor families. They're simply frustrated. In Washington, D.C. now, there's somebody just shooting people dead. He doesn't even know who they are. He's just so frustrated. This is how he gets his pleasure, knowing that he has the power.
power of control over people's lives. Stalin killed 25 million people in his own country. Such power, such control. In America, certain leaders of the past killed tens and thousands of American Native Indians. Power, control. In India, there has been leaders in the past of your history who murdered tens and thousands, hundreds and thousands of people simply because they did not believe the same thing they believed. That's not religion. That's simply extreme expressions of frustration for power and for control. Lust. So how? How to deal with that? If you can control your mind, your mind becomes your best friend. If you cannot control your mind, your mind becomes your greatest enemy. Why? Because it is an instrument of ignorance. It is an instrument of lust. It is the residence of your greatest enemy. In 2001, the World Health Organization has claimed that the greatest cause of suffering from the medical point of view, not AIDS, not hepatitis, cancer, heart disease, mental disease. In the generation you are living today, the greatest epidemic that is going to cause suffering and death is mental disease. How is this possible? We have so much scientific, technological, economic, and medical progress. At one time, if a person had smallpox, he died. There was mass plague, the black plague, bubonic fever. It destroyed over one-third the population of the entire European continent and London. In fact, in London... The plague was killing hundreds and thousands of people. And one medical scientist, he came to the conclusion that the cause of the plague is the fleas on cats. So you know what they did? They killed every cat in the UK. And guess what happened? The plague multiplied like never before. Then they realized it was due to the fleas and the rats. And the only thing that was keeping the rat population down was the cats. So a slight technical error <laughs> had a major effect on the people's lives. Almost half the population of the UK Died. This plague went on for generations. But now, medical science, we don't find it anywhere in the world. Now we have this open heart surgery. People who would have died by hardened arteries in their hearts and massive heart attacks are now getting extended lifetimes. 
These are all wonderful breakthroughs in medicine. And as far as technology, now we know these cellular phones. It used to be the phone rings. Nobody's home. That was such a simple thing. You just ring the phone, nobody home. But now you're always home. There's never a time you're not home because the phone goes with you anywhere. They have international. You can just, you don't even have to know where the person is. I don't know much, but I know one of my god brothers. He has a phone number in Boston, Massachusetts. And I call his Boston number and he picks up the phone. I ask, where are you? He said, Moscow. Another time I thought he was in Moscow. I called him on the phone. Where are you? Calcutta. Ah. Very, very great breakthrough. You don't even need to wire. You could just walk. Now they have these phones. You don't even have to hold them. Some they hold you. <laughs> you can just hands free. You just walk around talking. You don't even have to dial. You just say, "My mother's house." <laughs> hello, hello. So much technology. And all these satellite communications, television, computer, internet, emails. Ah, very, very tremendous breakthroughs in progress. They used to be the Pony Express. Huh? You've heard of Pony Express in the United States? If you, you'd write a letter, you'd bring it to the post office, and if you really want fast mail, you give it Pony Express. And these people would just ride their horse from New York all the way to Chicago. And then from Chicago, they would ride all the way, and the ponies would just go faster, faster, and every, every 120 or 200 miles, there'd be another horse that would pick up your letter, and then they'd run, and then another horse, and then, and about, about a month later. <laughs> And the, the, the letter would get delivered. And this was considered so fast. Pony Express. Then they developed trains. Ah, incredible technology. Trains. They just go... Mm. <laughs> then airmail. That was the ultimate, ultimate. You can get a letter from one place in a in just a matter of a few days. But now airmail is considered primitive. Yes? Somebody once asked me, what is your email address? And I told them my postal address. And they almost curled their lips in distaste and spit on me. They said, postal address. When I was in Italy, this young American girl was there. I was giving some lectures. And she was really enlivened by my lecture. She said, can I have your address? I want to ask you some questions. I said, 7 k.m. Munchie Mark. <laughs> Chopati Bombay 400007. India. And she looked at me. She looked at me like I was just, like I just ate a saber-toothed tiger and came out of a cave. <laughs> she, she said, what? Postal address? She said, I've never written a letter or bought a stamp in my life. Said all we use is email. But evolved. So what is this email? <laughs> it's there instantly. You don't have to know where the person is. You just 
and within a matter of seconds it reaches its destination. I had to write an emergency report. I was in Kiev, Ukraine, just a couple of weeks ago. It took me several hours to write this report, because I don't know how to type very well, because I had to do it by email. I was thinking, modern progress, save, not waste time, three hours. Then it was time to send it. And I accidentally just pressed one wrong button. It disappeared. (laughs) The whole thing disappeared. I'm telling you the truth. I went to get a professional computer expert. He spent hours looking all the way through all the different programs in my computer finding this. He said, I can't find it. It's gone. It's somehow or other, it's disappeared. I had to write the whole thing all over again. Now, if I wrote it with pen and ink, it wouldn't just disappear. (laughs) But somehow or other, so much technology, so much accessibility to practically everything and everyone through this computerized communications. and transportation. Great progress. The greatest progress I've seen in transportation after traveling all around the world for many years is the Bombay Pune Highway. (laughs) It's a major breakthrough. Instead of sitting at those guts, yes, just waiting for hours and hours and hours with mile, kilometers and miles and miles and miles of these trucks just sitting there. The truck drivers are just sitting on the roadside eating rotis and subjis. There's nowhere to go. Now there's nice highway. So much on every level, medically, militaristically, It used to be bows and arrows, then guns, then machine guns, then big, big pom-pom guns, then bombs, then atom bombs, then nuclear bombs. So much progress. Evil. So on every level, people's lives are longer than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The life expectancy of practically all the nations of the world that are developing technologically, medically, is raising, raising, raising. Economically, So much progress has been made. Time of our father, my father, the whole family would sit around the radio and listen. That was the ultimate entertainment. That was just 60 years ago. And then television, black and white. One station. And then four stations. Then color. Then satellite. Remote control. Haribo. (laughs) I've been to some of the lowest ghettos in India where there's nothing in the house except a television antenna on the top. (laughs) I'm serious. I've seen houses made out of flattened Vanaspati cans. You know those aluminum cans that vegetable oil is? They just flatten them out. 
and make the roof and then just a couple bamboo poles and some burlap bags for walls and on the top is a television antenna. <laughs> it's become a necessity of life. So with all this progress, why? Why the greatest medical problem is mental health, mental disease, depression. This is a serious problem today, depression. And it's not, the problem is not amongst just the poor people. It's amongst the upper class, the aristocrats, as well as the middle class. So much depression. Insanity, frustration, suicide. Just people's minds just burst with craziness and they just go out and rape people or shoot people. One person who was a friend of my friend, he just became so, his mind just cracked one day and he just ran into a bank to rob it. He didn't even have a gun. He just had a stick and he put it behind and he said, give me your money, give me your money or I'll shoot you, I'll kill you. And the lady looked at him and pressed the button. The policeman came in and put gun to his head. He said, drop it or I'll kill you. And the person just took, the, just took his cloth off and it was a stick. He went to jail. They asked, why did you do that? He said, I don't know. Just went mad. People are turning to alcohol. Turning people are turning to drugs. Why? Because they're frustrated. They're lonely. People need happiness. But unfortunately, in society today, people do not know what happiness is. The enemy of ignorance is promising happiness. Smoke this cigarette and you'll be happy. Ah, I've seen the hoardings in Bombay. All these very nice, handsome men and beautiful women. Smoke this cigarette and you'll have a woman like this and a man like that. You'll be able to wear clothes like that man there. You'll be cool. People will just look at you like a very, very fearless person. And then they write, smoking is injurious to your health, and that makes it even more prestigious. <laughs> really? After they started writing this, cigarette sales went up. How is that possible? In some countries it says the Surgeon General declares that cigarettes causes heart disease and blood pressure diseases and cancer and lung disease and has a whole list. Pregnancy defects. Some people say it may kill you. Some say it's injurious to your health. And then people are smoking. Ah, just to show the world, I'm willing to risk my life. I'm willing to sacrifice everything to be cool. <laughs> oh, such a heroic person. Such a great soul. Samahatma <laughs> Sadur Such great souls are very rare who are willing to sacrifice everything, who are willing to die to enjoy and be cool. <laughs> People like that. I was recently in an airport and the man and the woman, they were smoking cigarettes and the man would go <laughs> and the woman would go 
and they were blowing the smoke in their face and it was like the most ultimate romance for them. I was watching for, I didn't watch too long. I was just thinking, this is madness. They're killing, first they're killing themselves and they're killing the other person. And this is their idea of romance. And they were looking at each other with such incredible passion in their eyes as they were blowing smoke on each other. What do you know? So yes, so much tremendous progress, but Prabhupada, our Guru Maharaj said, there is a pinprick in society. There's frustration. There's depression. There's loneliness. The mind is simply not satisfied. The mind will never be satisfied no matter how much money you make, no matter how much sex you have, no matter how much power you have, no matter what position you have, no matter how, many la- how much land you own, the mind will never be satisfied. Bhagavad Gita tells why. Because this kama burns like fire. And the more fuel you put in the fire, does the fire go out and say, enough, I'm happy now. Did you ever see a fire do that? Put gasoline, kerosene in the fire. Does the fire say, I'm satisfied? The more you put, the fire gets bigger and hungrier and needs more and more and more. If you're a poor, if you're a poor man, you want to be rich. If you're a rich man, you want to be a millionaire. If you're a millionaire, you want to be a multimillionaire. If you're a multimillionaire, you want to be a billionaire. If you want to be a, if you're a billionaire, you want to control the vast portions of the world. And if you control the whole world, you want to control the universe. And if you control the universe, Hiranyakashipu did it. And he was frustrated. He was fearful. He was lonely. It says the loneliest place is on the top. When you have everything that everyone else is thinking, if I have it, I'll be happy, and you have it and you're not happy, that's a lonely position. And that's the situation of perhaps 100% of people who have it. And sometimes they try to make a show that they're happy. But inside, their life is superficial. It has no ultimate meaning, no ultimate ideal. So how? How to control this mind? William Blake said, The mind is such a thing it could make heaven out of hell or hell out of heaven. Even if everything happens just according to your plan, is your mind satisfied? Always thinking of something else. And if it is satisfied, how long does it remain in that state? Because the soul, the soul is seeking everlasting, eternal, unlimited love. But the soul identifying with the mind is filled with this enemy of ignorance. And it's looking for that love through the temporary facilities of the body. Krishna says in Gita that this ignorance, this lust, it covers the soul in different stages. 
like smoke covers fire, like dust in a mirror, or like the womb covers an embryo. Womb coming at covering embryo, embryo means just completely immersed in ignorance. Dust in mirror. You can't see yourself. The purpose of the mirror is to see yourself. But when it's covered by dust, what do you see? Dust. The purpose of the mind is to reflect your true self. When the mind is clean, you see your eternal, pure self, full of bliss, full of knowledge. But when the mirror of the mind is covered with lifetimes of accumulation, of debris and dust, what do you see? All you see is that accumulated contamination. So the process of human life is to clean the mind, not to further contaminate it. And how do we clean the mind? How do we bring our consciousness back to its natural state? That is a great challenge, but that is the greatest need in the world today. So much pollution. The ecology of the world, according to environmentalists, is on the brink of disaster. Solar ice caps are beginning to melt due to global warming. Global warming is due to unnatural Pollutions, which are born of simple violation of natural laws. Exploitation, with no concern for the earth we're living in. When Western people came to the United States of America, then it was just Indian tribes they started building their kinds of technologies with no consideration for the purity of the water or the air or the land. And there was an Indian chief, American Indian chief, Seattle. And he was a prophet. He said to the people of the West, he said, that if you, he said, Mother Earth is the bed you're sleeping on. If you pollute and contaminate your bed, you're going to have to sleep in it. Do you know, sitting in Bombay, according to some statistics, it's like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And all you're doing is breathing. So much pollution. So many waterborne diseases due to pollution. People eat fish. But the fish are born of waters that are full of dangerous chemicals. How do you know? And according to the environmental statistics, if we don't do something serious about curbing the pollutions of the world, one-third to one-fourth of all land on earth will be under the ocean. Solar ice caps melt, oceans rise, 
and Chopati Beach is only about a block away. <laughs> Hari Hari. So people are becoming more health conscious. Natural foods, natural clothing. Uh, this is becoming very, very, very important today. When people in the cities, we see, they like to go to the mountains. They like to go to a nice, beautiful river or to a nice, nice beautiful ocean. People love to go to natural places because natural places, you, you can just, fresh air and you can feel like yourself with beautiful scenery. But what is our nature? Unless we can, unless we cleanse the pollutions, the artificial impositions that are upon our mind, we can't understand our natural state of health. So the purpose of human life, according to the great Acharyas, according to the great scriptures, is to clean the mind, to make it pure. Instead of being frustrated with the insanities of endless desires, to actually feel peace within, joy within, illumination within, only that person is actually happy. Because please think about it. Is happiness something outside of yourself? Is happiness something you can put in yourself? Real happiness is a state of consciousness. Real peace is not what somebody tells you. Real peace is something that has to be experienced, understood, and realized within yourself. And the Supreme Absolute Truth descends in this world to reveal to us again and again how to achieve that real peace. It's simple. Every religious system, every spiritual path that is actually authorized teaches how to clean your heart, how to purify your mind, how to see your true eternal self in the mirror of your consciousness. first thing is we have to stop throwing dirt in our mind by our activities. We should live according to ethical moral principles. We can, should live in a spirit of service to others rather than exploitation to others. Within our society, we follow four very, very essential spiritual principles. No intoxications, because intoxications destroy one's physical and mental health and put huge amount of contamination to obscure our spiritual nature. We're already intoxicated by so many misconceptions. We want to wake up to our true self. No meat eating. The laws of karma. What you do to others will come upon you. Every action brings an equal corresponding reaction. That's the law of nature. Whether you believe it or not, it is a law. And it will act. If somebody goes into a store and robs it and the police come and take him before the judge and say, well, I didn't know you're not supposed to steal from that store. Well, the judge would say, oh, you didn't know? Okay, then go on. Doesn't matter if you know her or not. It is the law. 
So if we call, if we call, if we are in any way participating in the gruesome violence and death of an innocent creature, that has to come upon us. We're responsible as human beings. No illicit sex. Today, so many anxieties, so many di- diseases, so many in- frustrations are born of just unrestricted passion and lust. AIDS, hepatitis, so many of these incurable diseases that are killing tens and millions are born of intoxication and illicit sex. Some warning is there. We're supposed to try to control our mind and senses. Gambling, feverish. People feverishly go into a a, a gambling situation and it brings a greater and greater fever. It's intoxicating. Intoxication. Illicit sex, gambling, meat eating. These four principles constitute basic human morality. Honesty, truthfulness. These are very, very important. Why? Because they do not further thrust contaminations upon the mind. But how to clean the contaminations that are already there? There are many various sciences to do this. Through prayer, through meditation, through virtuous deeds. But in this age that we are living in of Kali Yuga, the most powerful and perfect means of cleaning the mirror of the heart is the all-pure transcendent name of God. By chanting the name of the Lord, it has the power to clean the mirror of the heart and allow our true eternal nature to shine. Awaken our eternal love within, which is the source of real peace and real happiness. Kali Yuga is an age of quarrel and hypocrisy. So many difficulties, but one great benediction, that simply chanting the holy names, one can attain the perfection of liberation. Therefore, we take very seriously, as a science, the chanting of this Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. When the mind becomes cleansed, when the mind is controlled, by our intelligence through the processes we have explained then param drisvani vartate then we experience the inner peace the inner love of the soul for Krishna the all attractive supreme object of everyone's love When we experience that higher pleasure, then the lower in, entangling pursuits of material existence no longer have any influence in our lives. You cannot give up something unless you experience something higher.
Bhagavad Gita does not teach that you have to give up your family or give up your career to be God conscious. Bhagavad Gita teaches you have to give up serving your greatest enemy of ignorance and lust who is seated within your mind. You have to clean your mind. You have to experience the higher taste of true love, love of God. And let that love motivate you. Let that love be the foundational principle of your family, of your occupation, to share that love with your loved ones, to share that love with the world. Many wealthy people, their greatest happiness is in giving in charity. Even better than just building a house for themselves. Because they build a big, big house for themselves and then they're the elevator doesn't work and they're totally in anxiety. The person sleeping in the street is happier. Something goes wrong. It's the nature of the world. If we have high ideals, serving those old ideals bring real purpose and fulfillment in our life. And what is the highest ideal? To help other people's souls. To enlighten people's hearts. Giving some monetary donation, giving some emotional encouragement, that is nice. But the greatest need of another person is they are lost. They are in ignorance. They have been defeated by their enemy. They need to be rescued. They need to be released from the prison house of ignorance. If you're not free, you cannot free another. So the more we clean our minds and realize God, Krishna, within our hearts, the more we could love the souls of others, the more we could help them to love. And that is the greatest need in all of the world today. The greatest need in the world today is love and compassion. Not money, technology. Those things can be used. But if money and technology are in the hands of greedy, envious, lustful people, they will not help the world. You may earn money. You may use technology if required. But let it be with the heart of love and compassion. Be an instrument of love. Be an instrument of illumination in this world. Many of you are young. You have decisions to make right now in your life of what your future will be. Human life does not last very long. Sometimes it is said that youth is wasted on the young. When you start getting older, you realize the years go so fast. If only I could do it again. You have youthful energy. You have intelligence. You have so many opportunities. What is your ideal? What is your purpose? What is your integrity? Do you want to chase after the mirage in the desert in a state of ignorance? Or are you really seeking the truth? Do you want to live for the truth or to sell your soul to the illusions of this world and just somehow or other fit in as another statistic? Death will come. At the time of death, will you accomplish the highest ideal possible in this life? That is the duty of every human being. Youth is the opportune time to make these decisions. 
But the decision should not be based on blind faith. The decision should be based on science, on research, on this subject. Who am I? Where am I going? What is the absolute truth? Who is God? What is the actual purpose of life? To make some money, to have some children, to die, and then to leave your inheritance for others? And then usually your children fight and become enemies over your inheritance. It's common. What is the purpose of life? This is the single question that every great spiritualist, every great philosopher, and every great man has asked. What is beyond death? Life is not meaningless. Life is full of incredible meaning. But we must know what that meaning is. It is an eternal meaning. You are an eternal soul. You are a part of the supreme soul. And your nature is to love God through everything you speak, everything you do, and everything you think. Can anyone think of a higher ideal than that? by spreading enlightenment and love wherever you go. If that is your ideal, you will achieve it. If you have the proper association. Association is essential. Recently was Dasera, where we celebrate Ram's victory over Ravana. If we look at the Ramayan, so many sacred lessons of there, practical lessons. I will be brief because I am over time. Kaikei. Who is Kaikei? Kaikei is you and me. Haribo. Did you ever think of her that way? She's the mirror image of all of us. Do you like her? <laughs> Look in your heart, you'll see her. Kaikei was a, pu was a pure-hearted person. She loved Lord Ram. She was faithful, chaste wife of Dasarat Maharaj. She risked her life in the battlefield to save him. And therefore, she was his favorite wife. She was willing to give her life to serve her husband. And she loved Ram as her own child. And Ram respected and offered love to Kaikei as much as he offered his own love to Koshalya. Kaikei had the same love for Ram as her own son Bharat. She was a virtuous, good devotee. But what happened? The demigods, devatas, they had a mission. If Ram's just enjoying an Ayodhya, who's going to kill Ravana? But he, well, he was causing so much mischief. So they somehow or other influenced Mantara. Mantara was greedy. Mantara was ugly and hunchbacked. Therefore, she was envious of others. When you have envy, when you have greed, when you have pride, these qualities 
are like formal invitations asking Maya, come and use me as your instrument. It is a fact. What people consider strengths are their greatest weaknesses in this world. If a person's proud, that's considered a strength. If a person has tremendous sexual prowess and lust, it's considered a strength. If a person's angry and just can beat, kill, frighten people, that's considered a strength. Is it not? In certain circles. It is a weakness. Because of envy, Mantra was an easy person for ignorance, for illusion, for lust to just enter her and use her like a puppet. And due to association with that mantra, Kaikei began to believe that she is my friend. Haribo. This goes back to the beginning of our lecture. When you think your enemy is your friend, you're in big trouble. If Kaikei knew that Mantra is Maya, she's a rascal, get out from here. Then Ramayan would be a different story. <laughs> yes? <laughs> but not like that. I'm your friend. I am your maid servant. I'll do anything for you. Yes, I know that. I trust you. You are my friend. You'll do anything for me. I must warn you that there's a, there's a diabolical conspiracy against you and your son. They're going to coronate Ram. Kaikei said, yes, yes, I'm getting all dressed up. I'm putting up my makeup. I'm all preparing because Ram, my dear Ram, is going to be the king. This is the greatest news. Kaikei, here's gifts. Here, I mean, Mantara, here's so many gifts, so many congratulations. Everyone should celebrate Ram. That was Kaikei's mood. Mantara said, you fool. You don't know that Ram is envious of you, envious of your brother. He will destroy you once he's king. Kaikei trusted Mantara. She considered her worst enemy her best friend. And what happened by that association? She fell into the trap of ignorance. That which is not Maya. Ram was her best friend, but she considered him the worst enemy. She wanted to be the controller. She wanted to be the mother of the king. If you're mother of the king, you're as good as the king. She wanted the power. She wanted the riches. Total transformation due to association, to putting your faith in the wrong place. And not only did she suffer by that illusion, she caused the death of her husband, she caused the banishment of innocent Sita, Ram and Lakshman, and she caused total desperate misery of every citizen of Ayodhya. Millions of people suffered bitterly for 14 years because of her. Because she was an instrument of ignorance due to associating with another instrument of ignorance and lust. It's a serious message. Who is that Kaikei? 
We are all spirit souls somehow or other due to association with this material nature. We're all trying to be controllers. We're all trying to be enjoyers. But our natural happiness is to serve, to be pure, and to love. Humility rather than pride. Compassion rather than envy. That's what we should be striving for. And then there's Ravana. Ravana was living in Lanka, the golden city. He had so many beautiful wives. He had so much power. But he was willing to risk everything because of his mad attraction for Sita. And who's Sita? The property of God. Lust. Ignorance. Envy, that filth of the heart within him, even though so many good instructions, he couldn't hear it. And ultimately, Ravana was destroyed. This is history. But the history was staged in such a way to teach us practical, personal lessons in life. We must come out of darkness. We must come out of ignorance. We must see the light. The light of the Supreme Lord's infinite mercy in our hearts and all around us and reciprocate by cleansing our heart, by associating with saintly people, by associating with noble devotional activities, and by associating with Krishna, who has appeared in his holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Is there any questions? So we should end by ten. Is there any question? Yeah, Prabhuji, uh, I got actually two questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, you said about so much of technology, right? Uh, so is that technology very good or bad? Okay, and the second one is that, uh, one sir? At, one at a time. Okay, fine. Is technology good or bad? It is either good or bad depending on who the technologist is. Just like you have that microphone in your hand. That's technology. It's a wireless mic. Now you can use that wireless mic to broadcast hatred, bigotry, enviousness, and violence. Yes? Or you can preach the gospel of Bhagavad Gita, peace, harmony, and purity with that microphone. So is the microphone good or bad? It depends how you use it. With email, with anything. Our dear Goranga Prabhu, where is he? He's on television. He is a television personality. I have anywhere you go with him, people come. I saw you on Atma series. He's very famous. All over the world, he's in people's living rooms preaching Gita. So, in that sense, the technology of television is very good. 
because Goranga Prabhu has appeared. <laughs> but when you turn the station, Haribo. <laughs> You don't find Goranga Prabhu speaking Bhagavad Gita on every station. <laughs> There's a lot of other lecture series going on. So what is it used? Technology can be a glorious opportunity if it is used by persons who have pure hearts and pure ideals. But it can be it can be utilized for the greatest power of damaging people physically, mentally and spiritually if it is used by the wrong people. Uh, so Prabhuji, my second question would be uh, we have achieved so much of technology uh, I suppose by having something called as desire and uh, which involves somewhere or the lust or passion to achieve things. So, in these case, uh, does this desire good or bad? The desire to achieve. What do you wish to achieve? The same thing. Uh, as you said, a place somewhere at the top. The spiritual world. That's the topmost place. Yes? That's very good. <laughs> Desire to be on the top is not bad. The question is, what are you going to do when you're on the top? Why do you want to be on the top? You may work for money. How many of you think that someday you may work for money? Only one person. Many people. So working for money is not bad. The question is, what are you going to do with your money when you get it? Are you going to use it for alcohol? Are you going to go use it to just go to all these cinemas and watch all these shows? Are you going to use it simply to, to eat, drink, be merry? Are you going to use it simply to, to have a big house and just go on living till you get old and let your children and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren just watch you get old till you die? What are you going to do with your money? Or are you going to use your money to actually enlight, help enlighten people's consciousness? Use your money to make your home a temple. Use your money to buy food, to offer it to the deity as prasad in your home. Use your f money to raise your children in spiritual consciousness. Then making money is a good thing. It's, a, it's an act of devotion to God. So the question is, what is your ideal? And how faithful are you to your ideal? That determines whether your life has spiritual integrity or whether it's just superficial. Puppet in the hands of illusion, ignorance, and selfishness. Does that answer your question? Huh? Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Well, uh, this is something I really had in my mind for a very long time. Will the depth of spirituality fade away with the time? as this technology prospers to such a height where the beauties of nature won't be along with us say around after 20 or 40 years or maybe after 2000 years where will spirituality go? Hmm.
You are the youth of t- what is your age? Twenty-five. The, the people sitting in this room today are potentially the leaders of the next generation. What difference do we want to make in our lives to do something positive in the service of God and the welfare of the world? That is the question we must ask if our life is to be meaningful. The greatness of India, historically, is people ask these questions. But as India is becoming more westernized, less people are asking these questions. In that way, India is cheating the world of its real wealth, its great, rich spiritual heritage. We're not against economic strength. We're against ignorance. Where there's knowledge, everything can prosper in its proper direction. Yes, if technologically grows and grows and grows and people are more dependent on technology... then the world will be devoid of virtue. We have to learn to depend on God. God is providing the sun and the rain and the air and the earth and all the metals and raw ingredients that we make our technology with. If that's not there, what can we do? We must declare our dependence on the absolute power and mercy of the Supreme. We must learn to reciprocate with the love of the Supreme. We must learn to be instruments of love of the Supreme Lord. Then we can utilize even technology to make the world a glorious, wonderful, enlightened place. But if we take true spirituality out of the equation, then the the consciousness of men and women will become darker and darker and darker. More and more confused, bewildered, and frustrated. We're not talking about a sectarian concept. We're talking about cleaning the heart and bringing it to its natural state. And the simple process is to chant the holy names. By broadcasting this glorious message and living it within our own life, we can do so much for the world. In this humble temple of ours, we're using lights. We're using videos. You saw that beautiful show. There's a lot of technology here. But it's to enlighten people. It's to be used in a spirit of service. It's not to exploit. It's not to delude. Whatever we use, whether it's our intelligence, our power of speech, our strength, our influence, our position, our wealth, our technology, whatever we use, the question is simply this. Are we being dictated by the kaike, the mantara, mantara of ignorance? Are we it being dictated by Ram? Kaike could have listened to Ram or mantara. 
She decided to listen to mantra. Therefore, her mind became her worst enemy. If she listened to Ram, her mind would have been her best friend. So who are we listening to? The passions of our senses? The passions of other senses? Or the holy scriptures, the great sages, the realized souls, and the Lord within our own hearts? Then whatever we use, we use it to serve rather than exploit. And in serving, there's great spiritual joy. In exploitation, there is further entanglement and bondage. We have devotees who are members of this temple, who are industrialists with tens and thousands of employees. We have doctors, lawyers, engineers, and they're very productive, creative, and successful in the business world, the medical world, the professional world. You don't have to be, an, uh, you don't have to be a simple pauper to be spiritual. You can be powerful. You can be dynamic. You can be successful in the society. But every day they clean their hearts by chanting the holy names. They raise their family with compassion and love for the soul. And they're trying to use their influence and their power to uplift humanity. And their lives are meaningful, worthwhile, and perfect. One more question. Sir, what is intelligence and what is the right mold or direction for intelligence? I would repeat, I want to ask what is intelligence and what is the right mold or direction for intelligence? Intelligence is the God-given power to discriminate. The senses are gross matter. The eyes see. An image comes through the eyes. The eye wants to enjoy. Actually, it's not the eye. It's the soul that wants to enjoy. But the soul is thing, seeing through gross and subtle elements. The eye is the gross... So the eye sees something beautiful. And it comes into the mind. And the mind wants it. Yes? I want it. How many times have you seen something and your mind says, I want it. I must have it. I must look at it. And then your intelligence is meant to discriminate. Is this for my real welfare to look at this? Or will it lead to my degradation? It discriminates. It rationalizes. It makes decisions. Yes? The tongue. The eye sees something. The tongue thinks, I must taste this. That's what the mind, the mind is thinking actually. The tongue just has this desire. Ah, and the mind says, I want it, I want it, I want it. The tongue is going, ah, and therefore I must have it. The tongue is crying out for this pleasure. The mind is saying, give me, give me, give me. And the tongue is going, ah, and the mind is saying, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. And the intelligence says, no, it's not good for you. Adivo. That's intelligence. Like a little child. Children don't know what's good for them. child picks up a knife. Ah, let's play, let's play with my brother and sister. And the child thinks it's very nice. He's having a good time with this knife. And what does the mother do? If the mother thinks, oh, let him, let the child do whatever he wants. 
And the child will cut himself, torture himself, maybe kill himself. So the mother is meant to be the intelligence. The mother says, no, give me that knife. So the intelligence should be the mother for the mind. The intelligence should discriminate. But the question is, whose side is your intelligence on? If the intelligence is being dictated by the mind and the senses, then the intelligence is spoiled. But if the intelligence is strengthened by associating with God, with spiritual principles, with integrity, morality, and, in, and truth, then the intelligence can dictate to the mind. So this is what spiritual life is all about. To arm your intelligence with knowledge and realization so that whatever the mind and senses propose, you can decide whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. If your intelligence is not strong by associating with guru, sadhu, and shastra, then your mind will control your intelligence. The example is giving that the body is like a chariot, the senses are like five horses, the mind is like the reins, and the intelligence is the chariot driver. Now the horse is pulled, the reins are going with the horses, right? But if the chariot driver says, no, you go this way, pulls her, then through that intelligence controls the mind, the mind controls the chariot, and the passenger, the spirit soul, will achieve his destination. But if the intelligence is weak, then the senses and the mind go their way, the chariot driver has no power to control it, and you're in a very, very dangerous position. Yes? What happens if you take a taxi and the driver is going 100 kilometers an hour down the highway? And you say, what's wrong? You say, I've, he says, I lost control of the car. The steering wheel doesn't work. The brakes don't work. Will you think, oh, very nice. <laughs> That's the way your life is going today. That's the way most people's lives are going today. Are you going a hundred kilometers down the road on the Bombay Pune Highway <laughs> and your taxi driver falls fast asleep? Are you in a safe condition? Very dangerous condition. So the driver, the chariot, is your intelligence. It has to direct the wanderings of the car or the chariot. No matter what resistance may be there. That is the purpose of the intelligence. Therefore, by hearing Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, by hearing Hari Kata, by coming to Sadhu Satsang, your intelligence becomes enlightened, your intelligence becomes strengthened, empowered. By chanting the holy names, your intelligence becomes purified and realized. And then you can actually direct your mind, your body, your senses, your very life in the direction that will bring about real success in life. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Is there another question? Prabhuji, can economic development and spiritualism go hand in hand? Can you stand up so I can see? Can economic development and spiritualism go hand in hand? Yes, very nicely. 
Economic development depends on that man should be always unsatisfied. And spiritualism tells that man should always be satisfied with what he has. Not necessarily. You can be satisfied, but you have a deep desire to serve. I ask you this question. Which is a more productive force? Greed or love? Love. You answered your own question. If you love and you see a need for money, and you're there to make money, motivated by love, compassion, and servitude, you can work harder than somebody who is simply doing it out of selfish greed. But you'll do it in a way that is beneficial for others, and you'll use the fruits of your labor for the benefit of others. When you were a little child, did your mother make sacrifices for you? Yes. Huh? Yes. Many? Yes. How many? And too many. <laughs> That's why you're such a nice person, because your mother made so many sacrifices for you, for your health, for your well-being, for everything. You were... In the middle of the night when she wanted to sleep, you would go, ah! And what did she do? Just, shut up. No, if she did that, you would be a nervous wreck right now. You would probably be some kind of a um, madman abusing others. Yes? But because she, ah, I'm so tired, but I love you, child. Take some milk. Yes, she did like that. That's why you're such a nice person. She sacrificed everything of her life for you. Was she making any money for it? She was doing it out of motherly love. There's no more powerful force in this world than love. And the more selfless the love is, the more we're willing to sacrifice for that love. So the purpose of a person, a person of a man who, or a woman who is in business is to make a sacrifice of love in your business. You have the highest purpose. You want to build a beautiful temple of God so that thousands of people will come and be enlightened. You want to sponsor prasadam so that Hundreds and thousands of people could get nice Krishna prasadam. You want to do something that will enlighten and invigorate people's lives, your family's lives, and the general public. Therefore, you'll work so hard. Not just that, I want position. I want more possessions to enjoy. No matter how much position you get, no matter how many possessions you get, there'll be no happiness or inner fulfillment through that. But if you're serving a spiritual purpose, there will be infinite fulfillment in that, to the heart, as we become purified. So yes, economic development is a necessity in this world today. Prahlad Maharaj said that for materialistic people, money is the honey. And there's many bees swarming around that honey. And they have stingers. Arriba. So money can be used. There's so many wonderful things. Money is power. 
If money is used for the right purpose, it could do such incredible welfare for human society and for all living beings. How many sadhus have you seen begging for money? Many? Haribo. <laughs> if it's a good sadhu who's actually doing good for the world, if you give him money, he could do so many wonderful things. Some sadhus don't beg. Some do. It's not that one is good and one is bad. The question is, what is their ideal in life? What is the purity of the heart? And what is the selflessness of their mission to help others? If we can help those persons, if we can uplift our family, that's glorious. You could make millions and billions. And it will all be used to bring joy, harmony, and love in the world. That is actually the ultimate purpose of economic development. And every single one of us can have that ideal. And ask yourselves, please, very seriously, now, what is the ideal you want to strive for in your life? Is this the ideal? Self-purification, self-realization, discovery of our internal love, and sharing God's love with the world through everything we do. Is that the ideal you want to live for? Or just work, 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 work out of greed? Possess, possess, possess. Raise children without a real direction of who they are or what they need? Are you the body? Are you the soul? Are your children bodies or souls? Do something for their body. Do something for their mind. But most important, serve the interests of their soul. That is love. Body, mind, soul. We should serve the needs of all of these. But if we neglect the soul, then everything else perishes. And the greatest way of liberating the soul is associating with those who are striving for purity, those who are realized on the path of true devotion, those who inspire us to take to the Yuga Dharma, the universal process of enlightening the heart, the sincere chanting of the holy names. Thank you very much.